right. And then we're, we're thankful to uh, be able to be here with you folks and thankful for the, the trails and their hospitality to us and giving us the opportunity to, to uh, be here today. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're thankful. Uh, I am so full right now of delicious food. <laughs> and uh, we went over and we had a, they they provided us a wonderful meal we're very thankful for that and and uh we're just uh we're just blessed to know them and it was great to have the 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 company that we had as well not not bad folks not bad folks they're, they're pretty good they're, they're all right first impression was good that was good so um we're thankful uh, for that and uh today uh, i'm glad to have my my wife with me and uh she's the one that that keeps me she keeps me uh on the straight and narrow, I can get out of hand. I tell you, it's hard. It's hard to keep me controlled, but uh, I'm glad to have her, and and uh, she's uh, a blessing to our family. And uh, we don't have our kids here tonight, but we do have three uh, wonderful children. We got Kingsley, who's four years old, and Corver, who is two, and Alistair, who is one. And uh, so they're with my parents tonight, giving them a hard time and uh, giving them a workout. Tonight, get, keeping them running, keeping them chasing. They got they got a set of stairs in their house, and I I'm pretty sure they they make my parents do probably a thousand stairs a day. They just keep them going, and uh, we miss them today. But uh, we're we're glad that they're they're having a great time. They they love going to my parents' house because it is paradise. It is the land of no nos. <laughs> you get whatever you ask for there in paradise, and so they're. I don't remember it being like that when I was a kid, is the only thing. But my dad got soft somewhere along the way. He got soft and he changed and he just yeah, he just bends to their will. I don't know what they did, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I, I hear that's common for, for grandparents. But uh we miss them today and, and uh we, we love them very much. Uh, what a great time we had this morning good group of kids that was awesome we we had a lot of fun they participated they took part in everything that was going on and uh they they kept us on our toes this morning but i think they did a great job and uh we're happy you know some some places you go and the kids they uh they don't exactly know how to respond when you want to do the actions and when you want to do the the songs and that and uh, i was proud of the kids this morning they just jumped right in they were screaming they were hollering they were giving it all they got I remember one time we went to a church and and the kids they were they were all pretty new and and uh, I was trying to get them excited trying to get them going and they were just not having it they just they wanted to just sit there and they 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 thought I was a weirdo and they were just staring at me and and it come time for the Bible story and I was trying to get them excited you know I was you know, who who's excited for a Bible story not a word. All of a sudden, this little girl in the front row kind of looks around, sees that nobody's responded, and she says, no one! <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> well, we're just going to keep on going anyways here. <laughs> same, it was the same, same church, same church was there, and there was a little girl praying in the, well, she was, she was up at the altar and had her arms crossed, and I said, do you want to pray? Nope. <laughs> all right okay well that's good well, it was good to have you here anyways thanks for coming but uh, i was proud of the kids this morning and taking part and joining right in and uh, that's awesome and uh, it's good uh, i will say that uh, you know we've been doing children's ministry for a little while now and uh involved in different aspects in that and you know sometimes there are churches that have a hard time when there's a bunch of little kids running around and it kind of it, to be quite honest it kind of messes us it messes with what we're doing. It really does when there's kids and they're running, they're, they're stealing the show and they're going all over the place. But I will just tell you that I appreciate your willingness to let the kids run around and be a part of what is going on. Uh, I've, ha I've been in services where there was pillars that were in the middle of the building and the kids climbed to the top of the pillars. And I've been in services where the children went and hid in the pulpit. Uh, but you know what? After a little bit of time, in church, after a little bit of time, surrounded by people that loved them and gave them attention, uh, they settled down. They they learned. They they understood, and they, they got they got a hold of it. And so, just keep loving those kids. 
keep giving them time, keep giving them attention, and eventually they're, they won't be running to get away from the person that wants them to sit down. They'll be running in the Spirit, and they'll be you know, feeling the Holy Ghost. So just keep, keep loving them, keep, keep, uh, keep just giving them time and, and, and attention, and uh, you'll see great things come out of that. I guarantee it. Uh, tonight I want to talk, I want to just kind of speak on a, a phrase that, that Jesus said uh, multiple times in Scripture. Uh, this phrase that Jesus said, he said, go thy way. He said, go thy way. And uh, tonight, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about go thy way. Um, because there was, something, there was something incredible that happened when Jesus would say, go thy way. The reason he said it is because there was a change that had happened. The reason that Jesus said, go thy way, is because a miracle had just taken place. Somebody's life had been drastically changed forever because of an event that took place. And so Jesus said, go thy way. He said, go changed. Leave this place different. Go live your life, do what you're doing, but do it differently. You've been changed. Your life's been changed. So I want to I talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, if we could just maybe let's just pray here before we get started and ask God to talk to us. Let, let God minister to us here tonight. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for your spirit that we feel in this place, Lord. God, you're so real, Lord, and you're so good to us. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would just minister in this place, Lord. This, this phrase that you said on, on multiple occasions, go thy way, Lord. You change lives. God, I pray, Lord, you would change some lives here tonight, Lord. I pray, oh God, that we would be so desperate for you. God, so God, so passionate, Lord, about getting in, in contact with you, Lord, that you would just change lives. I pray, oh God, that there would be a supernatural happening that would take place, Lord, in the lives of many people here tonight. Lord, that you would change situations. God, that you would change, God, our story, Lord, to, to, to reflect your will and your purpose, oh God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your spirit, Lord, would sweep throughout this place, Lord Jesus, and that there would be people that would leave this place changed, that there would be people that would leave different than they came in, oh God, because they've been in contact with your spirit, because they've been in contact, Lord, with your power, Lord, and the authority that you possess, oh God. And we thank you for it, Lord, and we're going to give you all the praise for everything that takes place here tonight. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, in the book of Mark uh, is where I'm going to be kind of pulling this phrase from, where Jesus would say, go that way. So if you start in the book of Mark and you kind of get to the end of the chapter, you'll find where Jesus has begun to do a lot of incredible things. There's miracles that are taking place. And Jesus, uh, he is becoming quite popular uh, in that part of the world because he's doing these things that people have never seen before. Uh, there's verses in there that record that there was evil spirits that were in people and he would cast them out and they would have no authority and they would have no power and Jesus would just speak a word and all of a sudden these people would be cleared of all these evil spirits. There's times where uh, there's, it records a woman who had a fever and Jesus just spoke to her and touched her and the fever left her immediately. And you'll also find in Mark chapter 1 where there was a leper that was, that was cleansed of his leprosy uh, all because of Jesus' ministry. So you can imagine uh, when there is a fella walking around doing all these incredible, supernatural, unexplainable things uh, that he would become quite popular and people would start to talk about him and people would start to be very interested in this new uh, man named Jesus that could do all these incredible things. And so once you get to Mark chapter 2, uh, time has passed, many miracles have happened, and people are very anxious and very, uh, very, very passionate to see Jesus. They want to get a look at this man called Jesus and to see what he is doing. And so in Mark chapter 2, uh, you, you find where uh, they're all gathered in a house, and Jesus is in this house, and he's ministering to people, and it is jam-packed in there. It is full to capacity. And uh, if I could just take this story and just kind of maybe apply it uh, as if it were to happen here in this church. You, if you can just imagine, in this church, uh, things are, thing, incredible things are happening. Okay, you've got this person, and they've had cancer, and it's a terminal illness, and all of a sudden they come in, and the church prays and lays hands on them, and they're healed just like that, and people start to talk about it. People start to hear about, oh, this person was healed of cancer, their, their, their diagnosis was, was, it was terrible, but then all of a sudden, just like that, they were, they were healed. You, you start to uh, have families that come in, and the families are tore apart, but when they get into the presence of God, they start to feel the power of God. They start, start to read his word and apply biblical truths to their life. All of a sudden, their family starts to get put back together. And so you have all these things that are happening in the church, and it gets to the point where there's so many people that are hearing about the events of this 
this congregation and what God is doing in here that the place is jam-packed. Just look around and see the empty seats. Just imagine that things are moving so well. Things are going so well that every single seat is full. And then all of a sudden, there's people that are coming in. There's no seats for them. they got to stand in the back. They're standing in the entryway. They're standing in the aisles. They're getting wherever they can just to be in this place where miracles take place, where incredible things happen. There's people backed right up to the door, and no, not a single person can get in the building. But yet, outside the building, there's somebody, and they have... They're, they're sick, they're paralyzed, and they want to be healed. They've heard about all the miracles that have taken place, and they want to be healed. And so there's four of their friends that's carrying them on this little bed, and they want to get to the front. They want to get to the front and let the preacher lay hands and let the church pray for them because they want this man that's paralyzed to be healed. And so they can't get in, they can't get through. Nobody's given them any room because everybody's too desperate. Everybody's too, too interested in what's going on. And so what they decide is say, oh, look, there's a ladder over there. Let's see if we can get this guy up the ladder. They get up on the roof, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the spirit moving, in the middle of the church service that we have planned, and all these great things that are going to happen, all of a sudden you start to see chip rock dust and sawdust come from right, right about here. And they got a big saw, and all of a sudden you just hear, Nyeow! and a, just, just, just a hole right in the ceiling. All of a sudden, they, they, they drop. They, they start lowering this man who was paralyzed right from the ceiling into the congregation, into the group of people that is here just to see Jesus move and feel the power of God. Can you imagine how far down many of your jaws would drop if all of a sudden you see a hole appear in the ceiling and somebody started to be lowered on a little cot, a little bed? Well, that's the case of what's happening here in Mark chapter 2. The place is so packed out, but yet this, this man who is paralyzed and his friends, they want to get him to Jesus so bad that they open up the roof and they start tearing it apart and they lower him down to see Jesus. And so this man comes into the presence of Jesus and Jesus, he, he, first thing he says to him, he says, your sins are forgiven. He says that to the man, and, and he kind of hears the murmuring, and the people, you know, well, you know, God can, only God can uh, forgive sins. Who does this guy think he is? And Jesus kind of perceives what they're thinking and what they're saying, and so he, he speaks up to them. He says, so, fellas, what do you think is easier? Is it easier for me to forgive this man his sins, or, or is it easier for me to heal him so he can walk? And sure enough, what he does is he touches, he touches that man, and he heals him. He, he forgives his sin. He, the man gets up off of his bed, he begins to walk, and Jesus says to him, he says, go thy way. He says, you came in here one way, but you're going to leave a different way. He says, you came in here full of sin, you came in here unable to walk, but you're going to leave sin free and walking on your own two feet. That man was so desperate to get in touch with God that when Jesus, said, that when Jesus touched him, he said, go thy way, you're going to leave changed. And that's what happened. All right, an incredible story of somebody who was desperate. And time and time again, in the book of Mark especially, you'll see where Jesus says to certain people, go thy way. Uh, there's a few different stories that we're going to talk about. The first one's in, in uh, Mark chapter 1. We referenced it briefly, uh, where there's a man who has uh, leprosy. Now, leprosy is a, a terrible disease uh, that results in infection and it results in inflammation. And what it does is it damages the nerves so that people, it, it, pre it prevents people from feeling pain. And what will happen as a result of that is maybe people could lose body parts or they could have uh, really terrible wounds and gashes in their body because they just don't feel the pain. They don't even know it's there. And then it gets infected and then all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a terrible, terrible disease. Uh, in the Bible, you'll read about it a few times um, and it, because it, it can be contagious. And so in biblical times, what they would do is if there was somebody that was uh, diagnosed as a leper, they would put them outside of the city limits. They would put them aside and kind of segregate them and kind of put them in a bit of a quarantine and leave them by themselves so that nobody else would be infected. And people that were uh, diagnosed as lepers were forced to spend their lives together as lepers, and they were deemed unclean by society. They were not allowed to have any association with, uh, with society because they didn't want to become infected. And the rule, in, the rule was that if they were to kind of come in amongst people who did not have leprosy, that they were to say, you know, unclean, unclean, you know, kind of make it known that there was something wrong with them. 
and there was this one leper, and Jesus was there, and this one leper, it, the Bible says that uh, he was so desperate for Jesus to touch him that he comes to him, he kneels at his feet, and he beseeches Jesus to cleanse him. He comes to him with a need that, you know, there, there's no cure for leprosy. There's no way to get rid of it. And, and this man, he's been a cast out. He's been cast aside. You know, it's supposed to be for the rest of his life. And that's not what he wants for his life. That's not what he wants his story to be. And so he is so desperate that he comes and he kneels at Jesus' feet. And he beseeches him to heal him. And sure enough, Jesus touches him and he cleanses him. And that leprosy leaves that man's body. And Jesus says to him, he says, go thy way. He says, keep going on your journey. Keep going, keep living your life, but live it changed. Live it differently. Live it different than you came in. He says, you came to me with leprosy, you're going to walk away clean. Then you have another story where there's a, uh, a woman who has a daughter uh, who has uh, demonic spirits. Now, here in our society, you know, we're not, that kind of freaks us out a little bit. We're not really familiar with that. We don't, we don't look at people and kind of see that they have de demonic spirits and all that. It might be just something you think of uh, seeing in a horror movie or something. Uh, but over in, in those times and in that part of the world, it was, it was kind of common. You'll see many times where Jesus and the disciples, they would cast out evil spirits uh, of people. And so uh, there's this woman who has a daughter that is possessed with an evil spirit. And she comes to Jesus and she pleads with Jesus to heal her daughter of these evil spirits. Now, this woman was a Greek. She was, uh, she was not of the Jewish people. And at that point in Jesus' ministry, his goal was to reach the Jewish people first. At the cross at Calvary, uh, it would salvation, uh, covenant would be made available to the entire human race. But at this point in history, Jesus was solely trying to minister to the Jewish people. People. And so he says to this woman, he says, the time, it's not time yet. All right? He says, it's not time. He even, he even refers to her as a dog. And the woman, so desperate for Jesus to touch her daughter, says, but even the dogs get to eat the scraps of the children. And she's so desperate. She says, Jesus, I just need a little something from you. I just need, I just need you to touch my daughter and that's it. That's all I want from you. That's all I need from you right now. Just touch my daughter. And so Jesus, he speaks the word. He says, go thy way. Because there had been a change. And the Bible tells us that when she goes home and she comes to see her daughter, her daughter is healed and sitting up in bed in her right mind. That woman came to Jesus with a need and he said, go your way because there's been a change. He said, you came with a need, but you're going to leave with your need met. Then in, in Mark, chapter, uh, Mark chapter 10, there's a man... Uh, a blind man, his name's Bartimaeus, and he's a beggar. And he had heard that Jesus was coming. And there was, a, there, always, there was always a commotion surrounding Jesus, and so he was blind, but he wasn't deaf. And so he heard the commotion, he heard people talking, and he, he, he was un, under the understanding that Jesus was there. And here Bartimaeus is sitting, and he's got a need. He hears the commotion, but he can't see it. He hears that Jesus is coming by, but he can't see Jesus. And he's tired of that. He's tired of always seeing, uh, he's tired of always hearing about things happening and not being able to see it. He's tired of sitting by the side of the road begging for money because he can't see to do work. He can't see to provide for his family. He can't see to do anything. He's just got to sit there and ask for money. He can't see who gives him the money. He's just there doing his thing on a daily basis. And he gets tired of that. And so this, this blind man, Bartimaeus, he begins to cry out to Jesus. He begins to say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody says, Bartimaeus, keep it quiet. Jesus is a busy man. Jesus has got lots going on right now. He's got people surrounding him. He doesn't need to be bothered by some blind beggar calling out to him for mercy. Bartimaeus, keep your mouth shut. Leave him alone. He's an important man. He's a busy man. But Bartimaeus, he, he doesn't listen to any of that. He just begins to yell even louder. He says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he gets Jesus' attention. His desperate cry for Jesus, he gets his attention, and Jesus comes to him, and he says, what do you need? What do you need, Bartimaeus? And Bartimaeus, he doesn't waste a second, he says, I need my sight. He said, I've got a need, and I'm tired of being blind. I'm tired of not being able to see my family. I'm tired of not being able to see this world. He says, I need my sight. And so, sure enough, 
Jesus, he meets the need of that blind man and he heals him. And he, that, that, my, that blind man can finally see. And so Jesus says to him, he says, go thy way. He says, you, you, you called out to me and you had a need. Now go your way changed. Go your way different. Go your way seeing. Go your way with a new, new sight, new, new perspective on life. With being able to admire nature. With being able to, to see your family. He said, go thy way. You've been changed. And so whenever Jesus would say, go thy way, it's because something miraculous had just happened. It's amazing. It's amazing. You, you read through any, any time, you just go in your, your Bible app, and you just search, go thy way, and you'll see in, in, in all these different scriptures where, where when Jesus said that, it's because there was a change that had happened. Miracles had taken place, and Jesus was telling them, you can go about your business now, changed. But there's one time that you'll find where Jesus says, go thy way, and there's no change that had happened. And there's this rich young ruler that comes to Jesus and says, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? What do I got to do to get that, Jesus? And this was a religious man. He, he, he knew the laws. He, he, he was uh, associated with the Pharisee crew, and, and he knew the laws, and he adhered to the law to the best of his ability. He had it all down pat. And so Jesus says to him, he says, you know the law. You know what you need to do. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't, don't, do all the, don't do any of that. You know the laws. You know the rules that were, that were given to Moses, that were uh, spoken to the people, that were written down for, for the people of God to follow. You, you know what you're supposed to do. And the rich young ruler says, oh, good. I've done that since I was a young man. Since I was knee high to a grasshopper, I've done that. I'm all set. And Jesus says unto him, one thing you lack. Go thy way. Sell all that you have. Take up your cross and follow me. And that, the Bible tells us that that young man, that, that when Jesus told him that you need to go thy way, when Jesus told him, he said, you need to have a change in your life. You need to have a moment of change. He said, yes, you've, done all the, you've, you've followed all the laws. You've done everything that you can. But the Bible says that this man was sad at the words of Jesus because he had great wealth. Because he had so much in his life. And when Jesus told him to, to just go and sell it all, he just couldn't get over that. He couldn't get past that. He, he didn't want to sell it all. Jesus was basically saying to him, he said, yeah, you've done right. You've followed all the laws. But there still has got to be a change in your life. There's still got to be a moment where you are so desperate. And you are so needy of Jesus that your life is forever changed. Because you see, this rich young ruler, he didn't need Jesus. He just said, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? He had all the wealth. He had everything he could ever need. You know, if he needed, if, he, if, his, if his house was, was starting to fall apart, he had the money to fix it. If he, was, if he was getting sick, he had the money to put the gas in the car to get to the hospital. He had the money to pay for the surgeries. He had the money to pay for the medication. If there was something that he needed in his life, if he had tragedy, if he had tragedy struck, he had the money to take care of it. He, he, he could afford all of that stuff. There was no desperation in his life for this man called Jesus. The leper came and beseeched him. The woman came and pleaded with him, even though she wasn't a Jew. Blind man, he called out to Jesus, even though people tried to silence him. And they all had a change in their life. Jesus, he said, go thy way, changed. But this rich young ruler he comes to Jesus, and there's no change because he relies on his wealth. He relies on the material substances that he has. And I wonder, you know, we have three accounts of people who are so desperate for God that their mindset and their faith resulted in miraculous happenings. And their lives were changed for the better because they were so desperate for God. They needed Jesus. And then we have one account of a man who, who seemed to have it all together. He seemed to be following all the rules and doing exactly what he was supposed to do, but he couldn't follow Jesus because he depended too much on his riches. There was three people who really wanted Jesus. They really needed Jesus. And there was one man who couldn't bring himself to want Jesus bad enough to have that change. And I'll ask you tonight, do you want Jesus? Do you want 
Jesus. Because the fact is, we all need Jesus. That's a universal fact. Every single person on this planet needs Jesus. There's a time in our, in our life where we will need Jesus to intervene. We're all going to have needs at some point in our life. There's going to be somebody that's got a sickness that, that, that can't be cured. There's going to be somebody that doesn't have enough money to pay this bill. There's going to be somebody that needs this. There's going to be somebody that needs that. And we're all at some point going to need Jesus to minister in our life. We're, we're going to need Jesus to intervene and change our situation. But is there something inside of us that says that I want Jesus? I, I want him so bad that I am willing to go out of my way to get in touch with Jesus. Every single one of us has needs. So if you're struggling with something, if there's something that's going on in your life that you're dealing with, don't be ashamed of that. Every single one of us have a need. Every single one of us have things that we'll need of God, that we'll have to ask of God. But do we want God? Because you'll notice that in all, each of those cases, when there are people that come to Jesus, whether, we, whether it be the leper, whether it be the woman with the, the, the child who was possessed with, with evil spirits, whether it be the blind man, you'll find that there's, there's wordage in the scripture that tells us that Jesus was busy. There's even, right before it tells us about the woman who's got the daughter that needs to be healed, it says that uh, he's, they're, they're trying to hide Jesus. The disciples are trying to hide him. They're trying to give him a break because he's been so busy, because he's been working so much. He's been going around and ministering to so many people that they're trying to hide him. They're trying to put him away because there's, he, he's, the demand on him is so great at that point. But the Bible tells us that he can't get away because somebody was so desperate for him that even though they're trying to put, put Jesus in a room and just give him a breather, that this woman comes before Jesus and she is desperate for him. And you know what, church? The Spirit is working and the Spirit is moving in our world. The Spirit is busy at work. The Spirit is ministering and changing lives. Just this weekend, we were at Youth Explosion in Fredericton, and the preacher told us stories of incredible miracles that took place. He told us about uh, six witch doctors over in Africa that showed up to a service, and they came up and they thought that they were going to shut the service down. And uh, the preacher, the, this, this witch doctor comes up on the platform and puts himself right face to face with, with one of the preachers and says, I'm going to take this stick and I'm going to hit you on the shoulder and you're going to die right there. You're going to die right here and everybody's going to leave. So the witch doctor, you know, the, the preacher said he did his hocus pocus and, and he hit the guy and the preacher just turned around, looked at the crowd and gave a big grin. Just smiled. And then the preacher, he said, I, I'm, I'm going to lay my hand on you, and the devil's going to leave, and all this and that. And, and sure enough, they, lay hand, they, they go to lay hands on them. This guy takes off, and the other five witch doctors, before they left, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The Spirit is working. There, there's something going on. There, the, he told another story that was so incredible. They, they were at this service here in North America, here on this side of the planet. And they asked everybody who didn't have the Holy Ghost to come up. And there was 22 people that came up. And they spoke the word of faith and they prayed for them. And right then and there, 21 of them got the Holy Ghost. And there was one last guy and, and he was an Orthodox Jew. And he, they said, do you want to pray? And he said, no. They said, do you want the Holy Ghost? He said, no. He said, because you guys believe that Jesus is God. And I don't believe that. He said, the only way I would believe that Jesus is God is if God himself came down and began to speak to me in Hebrew. Well, didn't one of the ladies beside him that was first time guest getting filled with the Holy Ghost, didn't she start to speak out in Hebrew? And, they, and, and, and that the words that she was saying ministered to that man and he was filled with the Holy Ghost, just like that. The Spirit is working. The Spirit is at work. There's big things like that and there's little things like this. We've got, some new, we've got a new family coming to our church and there's this little girl and her name's Lily and she's got... Uh, she's got uh, some sickness in her life and and she comes to our Sunday school and in our worship time she'll sit there and she'll just stare at you she sits there and she's got mouth wide open eyes wide open you don't even think she's taking in anything but then we get home from church one Sunday and her mom sends us a video of her singing building up the temple building up the temple and you know that's a that's a miracle that's the spirit at work you know, she's just a little girl. She's three years old. She's in there, and you don't think she's taking in anything. You think she's in her own little world, thinking about candy and, and all that. And, but no, the Spirit is moving on her. The Spirit's working on her. The Spirit is working in our world today. 
The Spirit is busy at work. But while the Spirit is moving and while the Spirit is ministering to people and changing lives, are you desperate enough to stop it in its tracks and say, I need you? Are you desperate enough for a touch of God that while the Spirit is moving, while the Spirit is changing lives and going all over this world, ministering to people, healing people, touching people's lives, turning families, turning families around, changing them and putting them back together, while people are, are being cured of cancer and being healed of incurable diseases, are you so desperate for a move of God in your life that you'll stop the Spirit and say, I need some of that? The Spirit is at work. The Spirit is busy moving. We're in the last days and the Spirit is going to move. The Spirit is going to work. The Spirit is going to be poured out upon, uh, upon, every, upon every tribe, every tongue, every nation. The Bible says that, you know, old men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. The Spirit is going to be poured out upon your sons, your daughters. The promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off. The Spirit is moving. The Spirit is working. Jesus is busy. But the fact that Jesus was busy did not stop any of these people from getting a hold of Jesus and saying, I want you to touch me. I want you to minister in my life. I need you in my life, Jesus. And so let me just tell you that your situation is not the end of the story. Your struggling marriage is not the end of the story. Your broken family is not the final chapter. Your emotional and, and physical trials are not the end of your world. The sickness that you're dealing with, the diseases that you face is not the end for you. These needs that you have in your life, they can be used for God that make a supernatural event take place in your world. These needs that we have, when we come to God and we say, God, I need you. God, I need you to touch me. I've got a need. I've got something going on in my life. You know that you can come to Jesus tonight and you can say, Lord, I need you to touch me. And in the spirit, Jesus can say to you, go thy way. Because he can say, I'm going to change your life. I'm going to change your world. Yeah, you're not, you're not exactly sure what you're going to go home to. Yeah, you're not exactly sure what's going to take place when you get home. But you're going to go your way and you're going to go changed. You're going to leave this place changed. Yeah, I don't, know what the, I don't know exactly what's going to happen at the next doctor's appointment. But you can leave this place changed. You can leave this place different than when you came in. That's the power that we have in this room tonight through the Holy Ghost. Through the Spirit that is working. You'll notice that the rich young ruler, he didn't have a miraculous happening. He didn't have a supernatural thing take place. He just left sad. He just left upset because he had no needs. He had everything he, he figured he needed. When he, when he learned that he was supposed to sell it all to follow Jesus, that upset him because he had everything he needed. He was set for life. And so he didn't get a miracle. He didn't, get, he didn't get a miracle from Jesus that day because he, didn't, he figured he didn't have any needs. He just wanted eternal life. He just wanted the prize. He just wanted the paradise. He just wanted to be a place, you know, with streets of gold and, and gates of pearl. That's all he wanted. He didn't, want to, he, he, he didn't want to struggle. He didn't have any needs. You may have needs this, tonight. You may feel like there's things that are going on in your life that you've been dealing with for a long time. There's things that you've prayed for every single night. And you wonder, when is it ever going to happen? When is it ever going to take place? Well, God, why would you give this to me? Why would you let this happen to me? Do you know that your need can be an excuse for God to just come in and transform your life? Your need can be a reason for Jesus to come in and do a miracle in your life and give you a testimony that you couldn't have if you didn't have a need. And God can do that for you tonight. God can do that for you here in this place tonight. And so I'll ask you, do you need Jesus? Yes, we all need Jesus. We're helpless without him. But do you want Jesus tonight? Do you want him to touch you? Would you be so bold and so brazen that while the Spirit is moving that you'd say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, thou Son of David, have mercy on me. Holy Spirit, have mercy on me. I'm tired of dealing with this. I'm tired of struggling with this. I need you to touch me tonight. I need you to do a miracle in my life tonight. I need you to say to me, go thy way changed. I need you to speak a word in my life so that I can leave this place different than when I came in. Do you want that tonight? Do you want that from Jesus tonight? Because if you do, Jesus could change your life. If that's what you want tonight, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Spirit could begin to work in this place and change your life. Maybe you've got sons and you've got daughters who are not serving God. 
And you pray for them on a daily basis. And you wonder, when are they ever going to give their heart to God? I believe that tonight as we begin to pray, if we bring their, need, their names to Jesus in prayer, I believe that there can be something supernatural take place. We can't even see it. We don't even know that it's happening. But God's going to say, go thy way. There's been a change. You know, when Jesus spoke to that woman who had a demented daughter, the whole way home, I wonder what she thought. The whole walk home, I wonder if she thought, did it really happen? What am I going to see when I get home? And am I going to be impressed? Am I going to be disappointed? What's going to happen when I walk through my, my door? How am I going to see my little girl? Is she still going to be thrashing and going all over the place and not in her right mind? What am I going to see? But then when she gets there, she is relieved to find that her daughter is just sitting in bed in her right mind because there was a change. She didn't even know about her miracle until she got home. She didn't know about her miracle right away. But she knew that Jesus spoke a word and said, go thy way. I've done something for you. I've changed your situation. I've changed your life. I've done something for you today. And so tonight, as we stand, as you're thinking about your needs, as you're, you're thinking about the things that you need Jesus to do in your life, the things that you want Jesus to do, because here's the fact, that the fact is that we do, every single one of us has needs. Every single one of us have things in our life that we could use some help with. We could use a supernatural touch. But do we want it? Tonight, do we want Jesus to touch that part of our life? Do we want him to intervene? Are we so desperate that we would just, we would come running to an altar and say, Jesus, I need you tonight. I've been dealing with this long enough, Jesus. I need a change tonight. We would be so desperate for God that we wouldn't worry about what anybody else thought. Even though people told us to be quiet. Even though to people told us, don't bother Jesus. Don't worry about that. That's not important. We would be so desperate that we would just call it to Jesus over the crowd, over the noise, and say, Jesus, I need you tonight. I desperately need you tonight. I'm tired of being blind. I'm tired of my daughter being, being sick. I'm tired of having leprosy. God, I'm tired of my family hurting. I'm tired of having this sickness. I'm tired of having this disease. I'm tired of struggling with this, God. I need you tonight. God, I'm so desperate for you that I'm going to stop everything else. I'm going to forget everything else. I'm just going to give up everything in this world, and I'm just going to follow you, and I'm going to trust in you, Jesus. Are you that desperate for Jesus tonight? Because tonight, I feel that Jesus, is, his spirit's in this place, and he's asking us the same question that he asked blind Bartimaeus. He said, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What do you need from me? I can be your healer. I can be your provider. I can be your deliverer. What is it that you need from me tonight? Jesus is at the edge of his seat. He's just sitting there waiting for you to ask. He's just there saying, come on, just ask me. Just ask me. Just tell me what you need. Tell me what you want. I want to be there. I want to help you. I want to get you through this. I want to heal your family. I want to save your child. What do you need from me tonight? What do you need from me tonight? Jesus, he's crying out in love. He's crying out with, with compassion with sympathy and mercy and grace and saying, what do you need? What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What do you need from me? And all he needs for you to say is what you need. All he needs for you to say is, Jesus, I need my sight. Jesus, I need my family to be saved. Jesus, I need my, my, my family to be healed. Jesus, I need you to touch my life. God, I need you to provide for me, Jesus. That's all you got to do. You're just going to ask him. You're just going to say, Jesus, I need you and I want you. I don't want to rely on my riches. I don't want to rely on the things of this world. I want to rely on you, Jesus. I want to put my trust in you. I want to put my hope in you tonight, Jesus. I want you to touch me. And if you want Jesus tonight, if you want Jesus to touch your life, if you want him to intervene in your situation, come to this altar tonight. Amen. Come stand before your king. Come stand before your healer. Come stand before your maker and just say, Jesus, I'm helpless. Jesus, I need you. Oh, Lord, I need you in my life right now. God, I'm so desperate for you that I won't let anybody stop me. I won't let any, I won't let any critics stop me, oh God. I won't let the crowd silence me tonight. Lord, I need you, Jesus. If you could be like that Greek woman and say, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. But God, if you could just touch me. God, if I could just get some crumbs from the table. If I could just get some scraps. If I could just get a touch from you. If I could just get a little bit of you, Jesus. I know my situation would turn around. I know my life would be changed, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's it, church. That's it, people. Come before God. Let him touch you tonight. Hallelujah. Let him change your life. 
Let him speak to you in the spirit and say, go thy way changed. Leave this place different than when you came in. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.